Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good to see you this morning in the house of the Lord on this great Lord's Day. It's cool weather. Feels good, doesn't it? Finally starting to feel like October. We wanted to start out this morning with just a special, special thank you to Teresa and the committee chair people and all the volunteers and all the hard work. Man, and all the volunteers, everybody put in such hard work. I mean, people were sweating, they were wet, they were tired, they were exhausted, and a lot of people didn't even get a thank you because they didn't get to get in the service because they were out serving. And so, to all of you, you know who you are, we want to thank you from the bottom of our heart. It was a great success, it was a blessed day, and you made it happen. Your hard work, your sacrifice, your dedication, so we can't say, Thank you enough, but we're going to say it anyway. Thank you, Amen. thank you, thank you. Let's give them another big round of applause. for <laughs> Praise the Lord for so many great servants here at Believers Fellowship. Amen. Well, I don't know if you heard about the lady. She got pulled over by the officer, and the officer said, Hey, you're going 15 miles. You were speeding 15 miles over the posted speed. Let me see your license and your registration. She said, Well, I don't have a license because I have five DWIs. And uh, I don't have a registration because this car is stolen. And before you look, there's a gun in that glove box and there's a dead body in my trunk. <laughs> he just freaked out. He said, I got to call for backup. So he calls his sergeant. He said, man, you got to come. You got to come now. And he told him what was all happening. So the captain pulled up, you know, and said, okay. You know, he told the officer back away from the car. He'd handle it. You know, so he tells the lady, he said, ma'am, uh, can I see your license registration? She said, sure, here. Kind of looks at it. He said, can I look in your glove, glove box? And said, yeah, looked in there, nothing in there. Ma'am, can I look in your trunk? Sure. Looked in the trunk, nothing in there. He said, well, ma'am, my officer here tells me that one, you didn't have a license because you had five DWIs. You didn't have registration because this is a stolen car. You had a glove box. In your glove box, you had a gun, and there was a dead body in the trunk. The lady said, yeah, I bet that liar said I was also speeding. <laughs> Now, don't y'all use that next time you get pulled over. It may not turn out that good like it did for her. But you know, that so illustrates how we try to manipulate life apart from God. That we can make things happen by manipulating, twisting, turning, and working things out the way we want it to work out and just maybe hope that God will bless our will that our will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And uh, nothing illustrates uh, that better or whatever person would illustrate that type of life of being a manipulator than probably Jacob. And in Genesis 32, 24, it said, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh so that the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. And we know who this is because we jump to the end of this story and find out who it was that wrestled with him because how he named it. He said, And Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Jacob wrestled with Jesus because in the Godhead, he is the one who takes the physical form. And we know Jacob, whether he knew it when the wrestling match first started or in the middle of the match or toward the end of the match, he knew that he had wrestled with Almighty God in physical form. And so because of what we know in New Testament, this was the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ that was here because he is God. To wrestle with God is the message this morning. Wrestling with Almighty God. I know nobody in here has wrestled with God. Maybe not in a physical way, but I'm sure in a spiritual way, if you've ever had that time with God where you didn't understand, you were mad, you were upset, you wanted it done your way, you had all these concerns, you probably had some wrestling with God. And I know this would not be anybody in this room, only Jacob, 
that Jacob's lifestyle was this. I'm going to do what I really want to do despite what God may want me to do and then I'm going to pray for God to bless it. I know nobody in here has ever done that. I know what God says, but I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Nobody else will know it. I mean, I'll still come to church and still act religious and still hold my Bible and still say praise the Lord. I'll still do that. So nobody will know. But I'm going to do it my way when I know it's not 100% God's way, and then I'm going to pray it like, God bless. Amen. That was Jacob. That was Jacob in a nutshell. And this morning, you, if that's you in any way, you may have a wrestling match coming around the corner just for you, between you and God. Now, to really understand this, yes, this was a physical wrestling match. This not, wasn't a spiritual symbolism here. This was God and man wrestling. But Jacob's life symbolically seemed to be from birth on, was symbolically wrestling. And I think we have to see that picture before, before we'll ever understand this one passage fully about how in the world would God have a wrestling match with a man. Well, first we've got to back up and see his symbolic wrestling matches. First of all, I've called it round one. I mean, when this dude was in the womb, he was wrestling. I mean, he and his twin brother Esau, they're in Rebecca, their mother's womb. Remember his heritage, his grandfather is Abraham. His father is Isaac. And here he is in his mother Rebekah's womb. The two twins are ready to be born. And Esau starts coming out first. And he says, hold on, brother. And he grabs his heel as if to say, get on back in here, I want to be first. Now you know, first, being firstborn has a lot of blessings. I know what you're thinking. A baby can't think all that through when they're in the womb. They may not, but how much of a baby's personality is already shaped when they come out? You know your children, you're going like, wow, they're already doing this. Well, the, the, a lot of that's already shaped, and I believe part of even his shaped personality, he was already wrestling, and he reaches out to that heel of Esau to grab it. And thus comes his name, Jacob, heel grabber, deceiver, supplanter, manipulator. I am going to make it happen. A lot of people die that way. They live their whole life saying, I am going to make it. I'm smart enough, intelligent enough, wise enough to make things happen that'll make me happy. And that was Jacob from the very beginning. He was called a deceiver. He was called a manipulator. He was called a supplanter. He was called a hill grabber. That's what his name meant. And guess what? He surely lived up to it. Because names in the Bible meant character. It meant who you were. It meant what you did. It meant what you were famous for. And so it was with Jacob from the womb. Not only did he wrestle there, he wrestled with his brother over the birthright. They, they grow up, and sure enough, Esau gets number one billing. And if you're firstborn, you get double inheritance, and you get the priority and authority of being the family leader because you're firstborn. So Esau, being the hunter, the hairy, the, the man's man, goes out hunting. And Jacob, being the mama's boy, a little more smooth skin, he stays home and he cooks a meal. And when Esau comes back from hunting, he's starving to death. And there is Esau with this bowl of stew. And Esau's like, Man, give me that stew. And Jacob says, no, no, no. Sell me your birthright first so that I'll be firstborn. He said, what is it to me? I'm dying of hunger. You can have it. Give me the food. And so he manipulates things so that he gets the birthright back by tricking his starving brother with a meal. And his brother, who didn't care too much about that great blessing of being firstborn, sold it for a bowl of soup. And then he also tricks him and wrestles with him over the blessing. Now, to a Jew, two things for a young man were important. The birthright and the blessing from the father. If you got both of those, that's big time news. And so now, their dad, Isaac, is getting old. His eyesight's getting weak. And so his, Isaac calls Esau and says, hey, 
And you remember, too, this is another sermon, but the parents had favorites. Isaac, his favorite was Esau. Rebecca, her favorite was Jacob. That's a whole nother story. But don't play favorites with your children. A lot of this story wouldn't have turned out as bad as it did had not parents started paying favorites. Now I can see the kids over there. Who's your favorite? Who's your favorite? They're finding out who's your favorite. You know, none of them are. They're both their favorite. All of them are favorite. Now, so Esau goes to his dad, and his dad said, it's time to get your blessing. But before I give it to you, go out and kill my favorite food and bring it back and cook it and let me have my favorite meal and then I'll give you the blessing. So Esau heads out. Well, Rebekah hears that and goes to Jacob and said, Esau's going to come back and get the blessing. You get it instead. You go in there and trick your dad. You tell him you're Esau. He said, but mom, I'm all smooth skin and you know, Harry's all Harry. You know, Harry Esau's good. He, they're going to know it's I'm not me. They said, well, here, I'll put some goat skins on your hands and on your neck and I'll make your dad's favorite meal and you take it in there to him and you say you're Esau. So he comes in said here's your meal dad and he said well how, how'd you get the food so fast? Well the Lord blessed me and here you go. Well you sound like Jacob but and then he feels his arms and his neck and said yeah but you're, you're hairy like Esau so I guess you're Esau and he gives him the blessing. No sooner he had hardly got out the room, here come Esau. Here, Dad, here's your meal. Who's that? And he had already asked Jacob who he was, and he said this, I am Esau. So Esau comes in and says, who are you? He said, I'm Esau. He said, well, I just gave the blessing to one who said that he was Esau. Well, Dad, you gotta give it to me. I can't, I can only give the blessing out once. Esau's mad and says, oh, he was named rightly. That trick or deceiver, he's already tricked me out of the birthright, now he tricks me out of the blessing, and I will kill him. Rebecca hears that and tells, Esau, uh, tells Jacob, you better get out and leave and go to my, where, I, where I grew up and head out of here because your brother will kill you. His life was based on, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to trick it into happen. And so many people do that in their life. Then he gets to the homeland and he finds a lady there named Rachel and he wants to marry her. So he goes to her dad and says, hey, I want to marry Rachel. And they said, well, you got to work seven years. He said, I'll work seven years for her, he said. And so he works the seven years and then comes the wedding. And so he has the wedding ceremony and then goes in for the honeymoon and wakes up the next morning and looks over and there's his, her sister Leah, not Rachel. That's why every Jewish man takes off the veil today. Seriously, they take the veil off because they know they don't want to have happen what happened to Jacob. Because he obviously didn't take the veil off and wakes up with another woman and said, what have you done to me? basically tricked him. Got a little bit of dose of his own medicine, found a little better tricker than the trickster. Said, well, it's our custom that you have to marry the youngest before you, uh, the oldest before you marry the youngest. Uh, That's just our custom. And so he worked seven more years for Rachel. And then his father-in-law tricks him and changes his wages almost 10 times. Wrestling wrestling with his brother, wrestling with his father-in-law. Oh, and then he wrestles with his wives. Remember now, he has two wives. Do I need to say any more? <laughs> two wives. That's why God said have one wife, not two wives, because, whoo, did he wrestle. It was a bickering match from the start. Why? Because for a Jewish woman to have babies was the big thing. And here is Leah, she's having babies like a baby factory, and Rachel can't have baby one. I mean, it's ching, 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 and Rachel nothing. And man, they are envious of each other. They are mad at each other. Rachel's going to her husband, why can't I have a baby? What's God had to do with this? Why can't I? 
hey, am I God? I mean, it's just squabble, squabble, squabble. And the two sisters are at each other's throat. I want him tonight, and I want him tonight. No, you can't have him. And here, have my handmaiden. You have my handmaiden. It's just a basket case of a family life because they're just totally squabbling with each other over this issue. And he wrestles there as well. Wrestling with his brother. Wrestling with his father-in-law. Wrestling with his wives. And that just leads up to this story where he wrestles with God. I mean, his whole life is trying to make things happen. Or, there's so many people that try to make things happen. And they say, I'll make it happen. And, and it's not happening. And so you, if you're in that situation of trying to make things happen on your own, you may end up as well as Jacob in a wrestling match with God because that's what happens. So here he is about to have an encounter. And four things we're going to look at this morning that happen in this most famous wrestling match in all of history. No wrestling match can compare. I mean, you may have some wrestler saying, I went up against this person, I went up against him. But Jacob can say, hey, you can see him at a party. Hey, I wrestled with God. Top that one. <laughs> you know how everybody tries to top you at a party? You know, hey, I went over to such and such. Yeah, but we traveled to such and such. Yeah, but we traveled to such and such. And here's old Jacob saying, I wrestled with God. And so we see that four things emulate from this story. Number one, Jacob was alone and empty. Verse chapter 32, 24, then Jacob was left alone. Here's the story. Esau is on his way. And he's got 400 men with him. He's coming to you. And even though he tries to send out some gifts, 500 animals kind of to make him feel better, kind of like an appeasement gift. <laughs> He's still headed on. He's still coming. And so Jacob has his wives and all of his children and all of his livestock. He's a rich man. He has a lot of possession, a lot of caravan, a lot of servants, a lot of people, a lot of livestock, a lot of property, a lot of money. And he has to send all of those children, wives, money, possessions away from him so that they'll be saved. He doesn't want them all to die because he knows he's fixing to. So he goes over the Janic River and here he is in this verse. He has nothing. He's been stripped of family, children, wives, property, possessions. He has nothing. It's all been taken away. He's alone waiting for death, waiting for Esau and his 400 men to come. I don't know about you, but God will at times leave you all alone for a purpose. And you'll find out that purpose in just a moment. So he's there, broken man. He's got nothing. He's a 97-year-old man. Of course, he lived to be 147, but he's still 97. And so here he is alone. And then all of a sudden we see something happen. Well, let me click that next one. Uh, you have to click it back there. We can see what kind of person he was based on a previous verse. So we can get a little bit of where he was spiritually. In Genesis 28, 20, listen to what little kind of commitment or really none, he had to the Lord. Remember, this vow came when he had that dream where the angels were coming up and down on the ladder. We refer to that as Jacob's ladder. He made this vow after that vision. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will. You never want to start your prayer or your conversation to God with if. You just will. If God will be with me and will keep me on my journey and then that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. Most people don't believe we're familiar with that part of Jacob. This is pre-wrestling Jacob. 
well, God, if you'll give me this, and if you'll do this, and you'll keep me safe, and give me plenty of garments, and take care of me, and provide for me, then, eh, you'll be my God. Otherwise, you're not going to be my God. You know what that means? God, you're in complete charge of my life, 100%. That's when you make God God. See, God's not God till he's God. You're God. He's not your God till he's God of all your life. He's just a presumed God to you. You're like Jacob that would say, well, if he'll do all these things, I like to call upon him. I mean, when I need something, sure, I, I can call upon him. That's what he is. He's saying it like that. He's saying, if you'll do all these things for me, I'll think about making, me, making you my God. That's not how it works. We make him our God with a blank check. Amen. And Jacob wasn't there. And a lot of people aren't there. If they're honest, they're saying, I'm, not, I'm kind of right there in my spirit. I just, I really hadn't made God my God, my ruler, my Lord, my authority, my life. Sound like you may be having a wrestling match just coming around the corner because neither was Jacob. He didn't have that in his life either. And so we had the next step that Jacob was not the aggressor, but God was, and he had a purpose. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. We've already seen that this is Jesus, because he said, I've seen God face to face. Picture it. You're 97 years old. It's nighttime. Crickets. Birds. You're laying out there. I don't know if he's sitting down, laying down, maybe out in the desert. And whoa! Out of the blue, jump somebody and starts wrestling with you. Boy, it'd scare me to death. And then later on to find it's God. I don't know if that fascinates you, but that fascinates me. I may be the little kid in me, but I'm just thinking, whoa. I mean, just, just wrestling around all night long. I mean, you see what it says? They wrestled till daybreak. I mean, headlocks, I'm sure, and wrestling, pinning back, and man, it must have just got, got pretty severe there as they was wrestling around and having all these, having all these things happen. Out of nowhere. Jacob didn't pick the fight. God did. My Bible tells me God is not a respecter of persons. Well, I'm glad that happened to Jacob. <laughs> he was Jacob. You don't think that's going to happen to you and me? God may just jump out one day and start, I don't mean a physical wrestle match, but you know what it is. He's going to jump out and be saying, this is what I'm going to do to you. And he had a, pur had a purpose in mind. And then three, J Jacob was crippled as a result of the encounter. And we saw that he had not prevailed against him. This is Jesus had not prevailed against Jacob. He touched the socket of his thigh so that the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. We'll fill in those verses right there in a minute. And it says, Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Peniel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the snoo of the hip, which is in the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the snoo of the hip. Here he is. They're wrestling. And it always amazed me that Jesus is not winning. Could not Jesus take him on? Oh, you better believe it. But Jesus isn't prevailing. Jacob's winning. And man, I wrestled figuratively with this passage for a long time. Seeing how can this be? And then I began to think back about when my two daughters were younger and we had wrestling matches in the living room. And you move everything out and let's wrestle. I didn't have any boys, so I'm a dad. I'm going to wrestle. <laughs> and so off we went 
and man, we got with it. Now, Rebecca, she never would join us, but it was fun, just us wrestling, and, you know, and just headlocks and you know, everything, and, and they, those two girls played rough. I'm, I fear for the person that thinks they're going to mug a girl and they <laughs> will take your birth. They go me in for it. I mean, I got some bruises to, to prove that they're tough, you know, and then it was fun, you know, and then they would get me, and they'd both in a headlock, and, you know, and everything, and, but you know, at any moment, I could have stopped all that. I mean, I don't mean to brag or anything, but you know, <laughs> I could have thrown this one over to that wall and thrown this one into that wall, but I let it go on for a reason. Because it was, they were enjoying beating up on their dad. There's something about, you don't get in trouble for it because it's a wrestle match and you can take out all your frustrations, you see. And it was fun to wrestle and, 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 and play around like that. Then it dawned on me. Jesus was losing it for a reason. He was letting Jacob win. I mean, Jacob didn't have Jesus in a headlock saying, okay, give up, give up. No, he was letting him wrestle hour after hour after, it says all the way through daybreak. You know what I think he was trying to do? Was wear him out where he would finally say, uncle, Well, at least that's what we had to say when we used to wrestle. I don't know if that's still the word, but that's always been the word in America that you have to say. If you're wrestling with anybody, we grew up saying you had to say uncle. So I looked that up. I wanted to see where that word, why don't, why don't we say just, I give up. Why do we say the word uncle? It dates back to the Romans. In the Roman culture, the father was the head guy of the family, of the, he was the patriarch, he was, he was the main man. But his brother, the father's brother, was equally as important, powerful in authority and respect as the dad. So to the Romans. And so when somebody was wrestling with somebody and they were hurting them and hurting them and they were finally saying, okay, give up, give up. And they wouldn't give up and they had to keep wrestling and said, you gotta give up. And then they would finally say, you're the uncle. You're the uncle. You're the one in authority, power, respect. You're the man. I'm not. You're the uncle. That's what Jesus was wanting Jacob to do, was to say, uncle, I give up. I'm tired. I don't want to live this way anymore. You have complete charge. You're the uncle. You're the authority. You're the Lord. You're the master. He wouldn't give up. He just kept on and on. Now pay attention to this very point. When he didn't give up, give up, praise the Lord, he only used his finger. Jesus would have used his hand or his arm or his leg, he'd have been dead. But you, Jesus used just that finger and bam! Crippled him for life. He had to live the rest of his life with a limp because of that one finger. You don't think Jesus could have won the battle. I mean, he, he knocked his hip out with a touch of his little finger. Some of us have limps today because we didn't listen to God, this person here included, that I am living with because at one time I said no to God and he got my attention through a wrestling match and I'm crippled, but every time I know the crippling, I know the hand of God and I don't want to go back there again. Jacob, I'm sure he said, I'm going to do things my way. No, I think I'll do it. I think I'll do it God's way. You know, I'm going to go over here and do this. Gosh, that limp hurt. No, I think I'll do that God's way. Because the rest of that man's life, he limped. Because God wanted to give that man something to remember. Never go back to living your life your way ever on any decision. Because he wouldn't give up. Some people just won't give up. They're so stubborn about it. They're so intent about it. They say, I'm not going to give full control to God. And God says, okay. <laughs> bam. And he can bam anytime he wants to in our life. Until we can finally say, give up. Say, uncle. And here he is. He's got to be crippled to do it. He has to be in this situation. You ever thought about this? This, this thought came to my mind. 
When Jesus came in the New Testament, He healed the crippled. Here He is in the New Testament, crippling the already healed. Because a man needed to be crippled. And the man in the New Testament, men, needed to be healed. See, Jesus is not just about giving a blessing. He's about giving us what we need. If we need a healing, He gives a healing. If we need a crippling, He gives a crippling. Sometimes we say, God, why is this coming? Because sometimes we need it. And that's what Jacob needed. He needed that in his life. And then the next point is that Jacob's name was changed. Then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. It's daylight now. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now you're probably thinking, the audacity. <laughs> Here's a man, will not say uncle. Finally he gets crippled, and so now he's ready to say uncle. He hangs on to him and says, I'm not going to let go till you bless me. But you're reading it all wrong. This is what God wanted him to come to. God wants to bless us, but in order to bless us, we need to be ready to cling to him and say, Jesus, what has happened in my life right now, I will never do anything else than to hold you close and cling to you the rest of my life. That's all he wanted. And he didn't condemn him for what he said. I'm not going to let you go to my, till you bless me. Jesus is like, that's what I want to do because you're hanging on to me. I'm ready to. And he did. He blessed him. That's all he was looking for in this whole wrestling match was for him to say that and to commit to that. And then it says, so he said to him, what's your name? And he said to me, said to him, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Do you know where the name Israel comes from? This event. The whole nation, a man's name, for, would forever be changed. And now we would say the word Israel instead of Jacob. Why? Because a man had a wrestling match with God and prevailed. Now here's Jacob. God knew his name. It's not like God didn't know his name. But he wanted him to say it. Why? Because you know what he was saying? Who are you, Jacob? Because your name was who you were. I'm a deceiver. A manipulator. I try to get things done my way and then ask you to bless them later. I'm a heel catcher. I'm a supplanter. I try to manipulate things in a way that I can substitute what I want for when I want and how I want. That's just who I am. All right. That's who you are. But you're not going to be that anymore. Because you know what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to change your name. And no longer are you going to be that manipulator. You're going to be the man who struggled with God, you prevailed, and you did what God asked. I like what Warren Wisby says. He said, basically he was saying, you're going to be a God-governed man. You're not going to govern yourself anymore. God's going to be in charge of your life. And you're going to be different from this day forward because I'm not changing just your name. You have to understand, it's not just a name change. It's a character change. And now his name would be the word we use for the nation of Israel all came because a man had to wrestle with God and according to this, he would prevail. Do you think Jacob might have thought when Jesus asked, what's your name? Do you think it went back to when he lied about his name, when his dad asked him? Do you think, it was, think that came up in his mind? You know, my dad asked me what my name was and I said... Esau. But you can't lie to God. He gave him the right name. I am who I am. But I'm not going to be that any longer because God changed his name. He changed his character. And then Jacob asked him, tell me what's your name? 
I can see God going, oh my goodness. This. <laughs> like now he's wanting to be in charge again. And he never answers that. Because the issue is not about God here. Because God's God. The issue is his name. But he said to him, why is it you asked my name? And he blessed him there. He gave him his blessing. You see, a lot of people are asking God for a blessing. But you hadn't said uncle yet. <laughs> God didn't say, well, you don't have to say uncle, I'll give you a blessing anyway. I'm God, you know, everybody preaches that I give everything to everybody. Well, everybody may preach that, but that's not what God says about his character. Here, he had to give up. And one the reason he gave up, because of desperation. Change in your life and desperation in your life comes from here. You know, when this was mentioned in Hosea, this same passage, or this same uh, event. It says, in the womb, he took his brother by the heel, and in his maturity, he contended or wrestled with God. Yet he wrestled with the angel, that was Jesus there, and prevailed. He wept and sought favor. He cried. A grown man, 97 years old, cried. Why? He finally, 90 Seven long years it took. You think you've waited a long time. He finally weeps and is broken and is ready to make God his God. He grew up with Abraham as his granddad. He grew up with Isaac as his dad and it still took him 97 years. I grew up in church. I mean, I grew up. I know my books in the Bible. I know my Bible. I ain't missed church. All that's good. But it took, he had all that upbringing too. But for 97 years, he didn't break down and say, okay, God, be my God. I give up. And then it took dependency. Jacob said, I will not let you go to Jesus unless you bless me. Now, I know a lot of people are going, the audacity of him to say that. I don't see, again, anything that Jesus says here that was against that. You know what I think? I think if you could hear Jesus' thoughts, he would be saying this. This is what I've been wanting you to do all your life is to cling to me and say, I'm not going to let you go. I want you as my God. I've never really been close to you because I've never had a encounter where I struggled this much. I was in this much pain and agony and I'm going to cling to you and I'm not going to let you go. That's all he had been trying to do in his life for 97 years is just bring him to a point of clinging to God. And he blessed him. He didn't say, how dare you ask me for a blessing. You can ask for God for a blessing if you cling into him. And he's your all in all. Because he was. You see, he wanted him to want him more than anything else. You remember Jesus on the road to Emmaus? You remember that story? You got these two men after the resurrection, after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, you got these two men walking down. They're headed toward Emmaus. And Jesus kind of walks in to the conversation. He kind of shows up. And for some reason, God had not allowed them to know it was Jesus. His countenance or something that was done to these men did not allow them to recognize Jesus. So they don't know who they're talking to. And they're walking along and talking about, man, this crucifixion and resurrection, blah, 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 they're going on. And Jesus is going, what? And he's, what's going on? Are you the only person that doesn't know? I mean, the whole city knows. And they're talking about these things and Jesus is sharing scripture with them and they're talking about all that has happened. So then they get near to their place that they were headed to Emmaus. And they're ready to go and stop the conversation. And it's the only place I can see in the scripture that said Jesus acted. It always says Jesus did, but Jesus acted. And they approached the village where they were going and he, Jesus, acted. He acted as though he was going further. Did you catch that? They're walking around and Guy's going, hey, we're going to our village. All right, 
We'll see you. And so he acted like he was going to keep on going. He acted. Jesus acted as if he was going further. Now catch this. This is crucial to this story and the one we just mentioned. But they urged him saying, stay with us. Stay with us. Stay with us. For it was getting toward evening and the day now was, was nearly over and he went and stayed with them. So here's Jesus. He's acting, acting like he wasn't going to stay. But it gave them the opportunity to urge him because Jesus comes to where he's invited and feels welcome. If you ever think Jesus isn't near you, it's because you're, you're not urging him or like Jacob clinging to him to say, I want to be near you. I want to be with you. Please stay. Please stay with us. And he did. Jacob, don't leave me. It's the same principle. So many people miss it in their life. You know, I guess if you didn't remember anything else, I guess you could remember this. Stay in the ring till you're ready to cling. And say, uncle to the king, and with blessing he'll bring. And that's the only way the blessings come. And a lot of people will go their whole life and never say uncle. Look at what all happened changed that day. His name got changed. The place that they had the wrestling match, that name of that place got changed. And the way he walked got changed because he limped the rest of his life. Everything changed. You say, Brother Tim, I don't see change happening in my life. I want to see change happening in my life. Well, it all started when he finally gave up because God had been trying to do this from the beginning. But Jacob had always been, listen to this, self-sufficient. And if that wrestling match with him and God's wrestling match with you wants to accomplish anything, it's to knock self-sufficiency out of the boxing ring. How self-sufficient we are. This happened in Genesis. If you'll read Exodus chapter 3, when Moses went to speak with God at the burning bush, in that chapter, three times, God told Moses who he was. And you know what he told him? He said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, and the God, I mean, of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He repeated it again. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He repeated it again. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I don't think he had ever gotten that list had that not happened. Because God was preparing this man. You know, as soon as this story was over, you know what happened? And he looks up, and here comes Esau. Something he'd been dreading his whole life, practically. Practically. And he looks up, and here comes Esau and those 400 men. He's ready now. He's had his God encounter. See, God prepares you for what's ahead of you. And they met, and it was a good meeting. And they embraced each other, and they had fellowship. And God had worked it all out. Because that's what God does. Jacob had to learn to trust him. So now when he finishes the story, he's ready to look up and see Esau coming and see how God worked it out. He also was going to be the father and was the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Those were his sons. He had to be ready to prepare them for what lied ahead, and he wasn't ready either. I don't know about you, but I want to be able, when God wrestles with me, to be able to say uncle like that. I don't want another finger touch. 
but God's able to do it. Because he hates us? No, because he loves us. He had rather us be crippled in some facet of our life and to have a walk with him that's going to really be meaningful and get the true blessings of life. What will it be? What is it that God has maybe been speaking to you even today? With every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet,